So yeah. let's start. Uh, let's start with uh, uh, quickly recapping what we did yesterday, and then we will uh, move forward to today's content. So yesterday, what we did, we worked on uh, models basically. First on first day, we understood data and representation of data. Yesterday, we worked on models. Which models we worked on? We worked on linear regression. We understood what is A and B and how do we mathematically derive A and B? And uh, what are the challenges in the regression data? If the variance is constant or if the variance is not constant. And accordingly, the date, uh, the linear regression may be linear or with non-linearity in particular case. We also discussed about what is mean squared error? How is it related to R square? The sum of squares is nothing but a mean squared error without the without uh, denominator, without one by n. Everything else is same. And uh, we also understood uh, when there is a non-linearity, we have to do transformations. Instead of doing transformations, uh, all the software packages give us something called link functions. We give the link function, it takes care of the non-linearity in prediction. And we also check the logistic regression. Uh, this logistic regression, how the math works, why something is linear, how do I get back to non-linearity or predict uh, one of the two values in the variable. So this is, though we call it regression, it's a classification problem solved through regression technique. Uh, we check this and uh, we also saw how do we handle non-linearity. If there is a linearity, the values will be in extreme. If there is non-linearity, values can come in between. So one way is to do transformation, right? If we transform the values, like if we take the normal uh, uh, standard uh, standardization, uh, basically this values will become zero. From 500, it will become zero. So minus one, minus two, minus three, plus one, plus two, plus three. And then we do square. When we do square, all the orange color dots will be in the beginning of the line and the blue color dots will be in the other extreme. And we can use a logistic regression or the linear uh, classification models to classify this. So yesterday we built all the models. Uh, we, we, uh, we built models so we understand data to some extent. Now that uh, this model, this data set has two columns. All of you see two columns here. Whenever there is a data in two dimensions, there are two columns. X is a column, Y is a column. So we have two column data set. Uh, we will discuss dimensionality reduction in this context in a two column data set, but this can be extended for any number of columns data set. So the math, the, we will not get down to equations, but we will understand what the math does how do we benefit from the math? How do we apply the same math elsewhere? Why only to dimensionality reduction? Uh, so that's the key here. Now I've taken this data set. This is a two column data set. All of you see the two column data set on the X axis or the X column has values between zero and six. Y has the values between zero and 10. So one comma two, two comma five, three comma six, 4 comma 7, 5 comma 9, these are the values. Now, if we calculate the variance of x, we get some number. If we calculate the variance of y, we get some number. Now tell me, there is a column called z, x, y, z. In the column z, I have all the values 3. When we have a constant value across the uh, data set for a column, what is the variance there? Variance would be zero. Zero? Uh, agreed, variance would be zero. Does that column add any value to our model? Mm, not really. We don't, we, that column is as good as uh, not being there. So, the idea is the minimum the variance, uh, the useless the data is. Uh, so that's the point uh, everybody should remember. Let's say we have 10 columns. One simple trick to remove the uh, 
remove the or dimensionality reduction as uh, calculate the variance of all the 10 columns and uh, get rid of the columns where the variance is negligible. Negligible with respect to the value. If the, if the column has values between 0 and 1, in that case also compared to other columns, the value may be negligible. Let me go to Excel sheet. Let me go to this data sheet. Yeah, if we take variance of all these columns, let's quickly calculate the variance. It's easy, right? So variance of sales column. Variance of quantity column, variance of discount column, variance of. Uh, so in this case, does this mean this is insignificant variance and we should get rid of this column? No, right? Because the values itself are 0 0.45, 0 0.2. So the variance will be in smaller number. So there's one more thing we can do. We can take the average. And uh, this is average, or we'll call it mean. This is variance. Uh, I would rather call it standard deviation, not the variance, because that's a formula there. Standard deviation. So this is the standard deviation. So this has 623 as a standard deviation. Here 234, whereas it is 0.2 and 2.2. So this variance is minimal, but uh, how do we look at this? There is something called coefficient of variation. That is nothing but sigma divided by mu. Yes, if you see here, the variation is all in. This the variance has gone up with respect to the mean, right? So 2.7, 1.32, 8.17. And uh, 0.58. So I don't see any variance is insignificant. All four columns are important. If I have to remove the column, I should remove the column quantity. I will not remove the column quantity because quantity is an important column. So uh, if the variance turns out to be zero or coefficient of variation turns out to be zero, when will the coefficient of variation be zero? Whenever variance is zero, then that column does not add value. The smaller the variance, coefficient of variance will be smaller. But then we can take a call that column doesn't add value and we get rid of it. So that's a point we should remember. Now these two columns have significant variance. Is that right? If I calculate variance of uh, column X, I will get somewhere around 2.5. If I calculate the variance of column Y, I'll get the variance around somewhere 5.2, 5.3 karke. So there's both the columns have significant variance, but does your common sense say we need two columns? The X and Y are related. How are they related? They are linearly related. Is that correct? X and Y are linearly related. So given Y, I can predict X. Given X, I can predict Y. If Let's say given X, given X, I can predict Y. So I'll have only Y values. Or uh, I don't even need both the columns. I can say this is, let's say, one is the slope. So y is equal to yeah, uh, x, more or less, right? y is equal to x or y is equal to x plus one. That is the value. So I have reduced both the columns. I don't need both the columns. I can store the data, store the information in an equation form and use it when needed. I don't need to store two columns. So, but uh, we need data for many reasons, right? So what we do is, let's say we do a straight line fit. I do a straight line fit. So this is a straight line fit I can do. If this is the x-axis, this blue line is the x-axis. If the blue line is the x-axis and I draw a, a red line as a y-axis. Okay. So it. If this is the x axis and this is the y axis, now you notice what is the variance. 
variance along x axis is much larger compared to variance along y axis. If this is the data, I would ignore the column Y, consider only X. That is sufficient for me, right? The variance across Y values will be very small compared to the variance across X. So this is what uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors do. This, these two lines are nothing but eigenvectors. The math will give you these two lines, eigenvectors. And uh, the, the values, eigenvalues are nothing but the new variance. How do I know what is the new variance? Um, let's say uh, this is the line, right? So one unit of x-axis to uh, what is the same in the uh, new x-axis? You can extend this to what we call Pythagoras theorem. Now this is the Pythagoras theorem. Now, one unit in x axis is equal to how many units in new x axis? This is the new x axis. The blue is the new x axis. The blue line is the new x axis. So, one unit of x axis will be more than one unit in new x axis. So, the variance for the new x axis has gone up and the variance for the new y axis has gone down. Originally, the y axis had a large variance but now it has gone down. Uh, originally, the x-axis had large, smaller, uh, larger variance. Now it has gone up significantly. So what we have done is we have taken the same points, drawn new x-axis and y-axis in such a way that we can get rid of one column of one or more columns of values. So this is what I have uh, worked out here. If you take this and apply the eigenvalue eigenvector math, it will give me the eigenvectors that is blue line and uh, red line and the new variance, new variance across x axis, new variance across y axis. These two new variances are nothing but the eigenvalues. So we get two eigenvalues and two eigenvectors for a two dimensional data. Now that we have two eigenvalues, two eigenvectors, Two eigenvalues are the nothing but two new variances and we decide whether to keep the uh, column or not. And we end up something like this. So we will retain only the values in x-axis and we will remove the column y. So the math is given here in Excel. Uh, it's in the sheet called eigen. So these are the original uh, data x is equal to this, y is equal to this, and uh, where is this? Okay, I have used uh, Wolfram Alpha to calculate the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So I have given the link. You can also go here and uh, check it out. Yes, 2, 4, 4, 10 is the matrix. So we calculate the variance matrix. So we calculate the, this is the variance matrix for the data there. Uh, in this case, it is this data, 2, 4, for 10 is the variance covariance matrix. We calculate this covariance matrix and for the covariance matrix, we calculate the uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Okay, it's not calculating for some reason, I think. Okay, it's taking time. It's doing it. It's taking time. So we end up getting these two vectors as eigenvectors. These two values are eigenvalues. So eigenvalues are represented in uh, a matrix of this form. Uh, this is the eigenvector one, this is the eigen, eigenvalue one, eigenvalue two, the other two is zero. So eigenvalues are always represented in diagonal matrix. And uh, this is the uh, eigenvectors, but they don't give the um, you know, normalized or unit vector. So to convert the unit vector, I had to find the norm and do the, some maths here. So I got the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors and then the math is performed here. We get a new set of uh, X and Y. And uh, as I said, uh, this is standard deviation. If you notice here, the standard deviation of column Y is 0.36. The standard deviation of column X is 0.63. So 63% of uh, standard deviation is in column X. So I ignore uh, column Y. 
column Y is provided here. Column X. So I will consider only this column. I'll ignore this column. So I have in effect, I have removed the column Y and reduced the data set from two column data set to one column data set. And if you have 10 different columns, uh, you can use this eigenvalues, uh, eigenvectors, uh, then reduce the data set. That's one way to look at it. What is the other way to look at it? Uh, okay, dimensionality reduction. There are two more ways to look at it. One we already discussed. What was that? We discussed something called uh, variance, uh, least variance. Find out the variance uh, and uh, consider least variance columns. for uh, removal from data set. That is one way. There is another thing called multicollinearity. Multicollinearity is uh, uh, similar, but uh, math is a lot simpler. Multicollinearity is nothing but if two values are correlated, two columns are correlated, in this case it is. In this case, both X and Y are correlated and there's a linear relationship. Agreed? In this case, if two values are correlated, uh, which column can I remove? Because if I know one column, the other column can be derived. In this particular case, we cannot decide which one to remove based on the correlation coefficient because both have sufficient variance. Uh, so if uh, two columns are correlated and we can remove the column with the minimum variance. If two columns are correlated, correlation coefficient, with a value between minus one and plus one. In this case, it will be plus one because positive correlation and a high correlation. Uh, remove the column. Column with significantly low. Variance. In this case, it is correlated, but both has significantly high variance. There is nothing called significantly low variance. But if there is one such, then that is another way to remove the column and reduce the data set. This is the dimensionality reduction. Any thoughts, any questions we can discuss. Uh, Ramanathan, one question. Sure. Uh, the dimensionality reduction, I understand mathematically we are trying to, let's say, remove the axis which may not have an impact. Mm -hmm. Right, but uh, what does it mean conceptually? What am I effectively doing? What are we effectively doing is uh, data sets are huge, right? So the smaller the data set, your model building will be quicker. If you have a huge okay. data set, let's say there are 200 columns and you want mm -hmm. to build a predictive model, it will take long time and too many variables will confound the model. When I say confound the model, may not all the variables may not be effective. So, but it will try to fit all the 200 variables and model may not make sense. In, instead, if you bring down the number of variables to five or 10, you can explain the model better. So there are a lot of uh, advantages, right? Uh, instead of building a model with 25 variables, there's another model with five variables. Uh, the client or the consumer would go with the model with uh, five variables. It's easy to comprehend, easy to interpret, easy to explain. Okay. And uh, it goes easy on the resources also. You don't need uh, machines with uh, a large memory and large number of processors. Okay. Fewer processors will suffice. You don't, you know, you will have memory constraints. You will have processing constraints. Those can be addressed. And okay. the model so, will also make sense. Fewer variables, model will make sense. So effectively, sorry. Yeah, please go ahead. So effectively, what we are trying to do is we are trying to see which are the significant independent variables. Finally, we'll decide my dependent variable result. And that is the part of the modeling exercise. This is only dimensionality reduction. Which variable I can remove from the data set without losing information? OK. That is the ask. OK. Yep. And uh, 
these techniques, whatever three techniques we have, this, not this, these two techniques has a very uh, important assumption. The assumption is it has to be linearly related. These are linear techniques. Linearity is assumed. What if the relationship between X and Y are not linear? What if the relationship between X and Y are not linear? Let's say the data looks different or very nonlinear. Then uh, your eigenvalues and eigenvectors will not do what we intend to do. It's not going to get the column with the minimum variance or it's not going to model the variance. So in those cases, what do we do? And there's an assumption many people were using PCA. This is called principal component analysis, by the way. Uh, let me put it. This is called principal component analysis, by the way. And uh, this is a, a this whole math and concept is under the assumption that relationship between the variables involved are linear. If it is non-linear, what do we do? Now it's all going to be we can take it for granted. Many many a times it will be non-linear. Then there are latest techniques or uh, not latest uh, deep learning techniques called auto encoders. So exploring auto encoders would help. If it is non-linear, auto encoders is what is going to help. In auto encoders, we give the 10 column data and we say, how many columns we are will be able to handle it and it let's say we give three columns and it will give us a three column output but we there is no one to one relationship like pca here one next one x axis got transformed into a new x axis old y axis got transformed into a new y axis there is no one to one relationship there but auto encoders is the way uh, forward for uh, 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 Dimensionality reduction. There the math is all simple. We'll quickly discuss the math, but uh, that's from the neural network perspective. We can discuss auto encoder and some other time. Okay, so this is the main assumption uh, linearity. This is called the PCA principal component analysis and it will, con it will consider every axis as a component and insignificant components are removed from the data. Only significant components are retained and uh, the new. New X axis is what. Will be used for our analysis for all practical purposes. OK, the math you can take a look at it. This is all Excel. All the formulas are all available. Uh, if you spend time, uh, you will be able to figure it out. I did not want to get into this matrix uh, equations and stuff. Instead, we'll move and uh, we'll do the next. So, so far what we have been looking at was all statistical modeling. Yeah, what is statistical modeling? This uh, regression equation, this is called normal equations. So normal equations to solve regression parameters. Um, this R square, mean squared error, this transformations for nonlinearity, uh, logic transformation, and uh, uh, to some extent this three methods are all statistical modeling. Now let's see what is machine learning. So we have two variables X and Y. We want to. Uh, what is that we want to predict? We want to predict the slope. If we have to mathematically derive, we should have, have used normal equations. Now machine has to do it. Machine does not have any idea about what normal equation is, what least square regression is. How will machine know that? So what machine does this? Let me take a line. Let me choose a color and uh, this thing. OK. What will machine do is it will start. It will assume a slope. And calculate the error. So this is a line. It is assumption. It assumes uh, slope is going to be like uh, 30 degrees or uh, 0.8 is the slope. 
and it will fit the for the point eight slope. It will uh, calculate the error. So for this line, the error will be higher here. Error will be this lower here. The error will go higher here. So the mean squared error will be a number. I got a mean squared error as a number. Now it will change the slope in the one direction. Now it has changed the slope to this. Again, it will find the error. After finding the error, if the error is higher, then it understands it has moved in the wrong direction. Then the machine will change the slope in the other direction. Yeah, the error has come down. And uh, further down, it will try to change the slope. And it will keep changing the slope, finding the error until the error is minimum. So what is happening here? To put it very crudely, I'm sorry but, uh, to send the message across. I'm going to put it very crudely. What is happening is your trial and error. Is that something everybody agrees? What machine does is it takes all the parameters that needs to be, you know, identified or how do I put it, estimated. It in this case there is only one parameter or two parameters, right? Y equal to mx plus c. So uh, constant is going to be somewhere negative, and slope is going to be positive. So two parameters it has to learn. It basically does trial and error based on what we call cost function. So cost function in this case is nothing but. Mean squared error. Yeah, mean squared error cost function. Uh, given the cost function, it will try to minimize the cost function um, while choosing the parameters. It, there may be two parameters involved in the model or maybe 10 parameters, maybe hundreds of parameters. Uh, what if in effect happens is trial and error so that the mean squared error can be minimized or a cost function can be minimized. Now that we learned what a cost function is and if you notice there is no math involved, the normal equation is not involved. All that math which we uh, discussed yesterday. So uh, is that is this absolutely trial and error? Is this that mad? Uh, so machine will start somewhere and uh, try various things and end up with the best parameter. No, there is a method to madness. The method to madness is called back propagation. It calculates the error. It takes a, it starts with the trial and error. It assumes a slope. And how in which direction the slope will change depends on uh, what the mean squared error is and the math involved in changing the parameters is called back propagation. Back propagation is uh, done using, uh, you know, okay, propagation spelling out. Well, the differential calculus. So that's for another day, but uh, this much is sufficient for today. So back propagation is nothing but a differential calculus. It does uh, uh, uses the differential mathematics uh, to uh, change the parameters such that uh, we uh, uh, arrive at the mean squared error quickly. And there is another concept called learning rate. So back propagation along with the learning rate will uh, give method to the madness of trial and error. So learning rate uh, optimization. These are the uh, few. Uh, uh, let's take it as jargons, but uh, these are all topics on their own. We will discuss this some other time. OK, so this is the madness. Uh, now that we know this is how machines learn, but why should it be effective? OK, machines learn and we can always blame it on the machine, right? Things did not work later. We can always say that. So why machine learning may be effective? So the machine learning will be effective because we divide the data set into two data sets, training data set and testing data set. So what in effect happens is whenever there is a model, uh, whenever there is a parameter estimated in the training data set, the 
same parameter is applied to the test data set and the error between train and test are compared. It has to be uh, more or less same or uh, yeah, it has to be more or less same or test data set should have a better error. So test data set is something which is not used for identifying the parameters. Train data set is the data set that is used for determining the parameter values. For example, in this case, the parameter value is the slope. It will do the, it will guess the slope and it will get the mean squared error and then apply the same slope here and see if the error are comparable. So this is why machine learning is effective. So people with me. So wh what works in machine learning? Uh, the uh, uh, the trial and error, but trial and error has some uh, boundaries. One boundary is the cost function. It will try to minimize the cost function and uses the back propagation to uh, do the estimate the parameters and uh, train divide the data set into train and test and we uh, uh, whatever we uh, estimate with the training data set uh, we test it with the test data set and ensure things are working this is why machine learning is by and large effective okay and is it effective all the time that's a question right is it effective 100% of the time? In which cases it won't be effective? So if you consider machine learning as a function that takes input and gives an output. Let's say if you consider that way. And one input has two outputs. OK, I've got the wrong one. Uh, one input has, uh, this is many to one. I should have got many, one to many. I should have got one to many. Okay, fine. Uh, it's a wrong example. I will put it sometime. One to many mapping. What is one to many mapping? One input has two outputs. For example, if square root is the function, I give 4 as the input. The output can be 2 or minus 2, right? Plus or minus 2. That's a one to many mapping. In that case, if I have written a machine learning program to find square root, what it will return? If I give 4 as the input, should it return 2 or minus 2? Both are correct, right? Both are correct, but machine cannot learn, right? One input can give only one output. So five is going to get an output of one, seven is going to get an output of zero, three is going to get an output of four, two is going to get an output of four. What if seven has two outputs, zero and one? What will the machine do? You give a image. Uh, okay, uh, let's take an example. We already discussed this example. All of you remember this example. X is the input. Y is the output. Four cases has zero. Two cases has one as the output. Is this something all of you remember? 30 is the input. Two cases has zero as the output. Seven cases has one as the output. So for the same input, I got two outputs. If there is one input and one output, if there is one to one mapping, machine learning will work. OK, if there is more than one output. What will happen when we say machine learning will not work? What will happen? Your accuracy will go down. That's all. Let's say in this particular example, we have same numbers between 0 and 1. 28 has four zeros and four ones. 29 has three zeros and three ones. 30 has seven zeros and seven ones. 31 has all this. 
in that case what will be the <coughs> maximum accuracy you will get 50% right your output is going to be only one either a, a credit card is sanctioned credit card application is approved or not this x is the credit score approved means one not approved means zero if all the numbers are equal assuming all the numbers are equal your model is going to predict either zero or one it's not going to predict both in that case the maximum accuracy you will hit is 50 percent in this particular case what will be the accuracy tell me uh, in this in this case four and two 28 is the input what it will give we expect it to give zero if 28 is the input, we want to give zero because four out of six is zero. It's not exactly equal, right? It's not three and three, so four out of six. So in this case, four uh, plus five, four plus three is seven, uh, seven plus seven is 14, 14 plus four, seven is 21, uh, 21 plus 30 is 51 out of, 51 out of, uh, uh, how much is this? 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So 51 out of uh, 64 is accurate. We can get only so much. We can never get more than 51 accurate values. So we get an idea of what is the expected accuracy. So the expected accuracy for this particular data set will be, I can do something here, 51 out of 65. So 80% is the maximum accuracy I get. I cannot get more than 80% accuracy because there is one input has more than one output in the data set. So machine has to uh, learn and uh, maximize the uh, accuracy, minimize the mean squared error, whatever, minimize the cost function in this case, and it will get only maximum 80% accuracy if your model is best. There is no point trying to improve the accuracy beyond 80%. Is this something clear? We get an accuracy of the model. Uh, we get an idea on accuracy of the model before even modeling it. We can get it. That's what the point is. And the reason for accuracy is to go down is one input having more than one output, uh, more than one exclusive output, not uh, uh, there are there are some exceptions where more than one output is all valid. For example, in YOLO, given one image, it can predict what are the objects. It can predict five objects in the uh, image. It can predict 10 objects in the image. That's not what we are talking about. We are talking about uh, outputs like these exclusive ones. If there is zero, it, there cannot be one. If there is one, there cannot be a zero. So next time when you are handed over a problem statement, with the data, uh, we uh, should have an idea whether it is one to many, one to one, or many to one. Many to one and one to one, we don't have a problem. One input has only one corresponding output. In case of one to many, we should have an idea what is the maximum accuracy one can achieve. Is this okay, guys? So in these cases, Machine learning will be effective, otherwise it will be less effective. That's what the point is. So we discussed what is machine learning, how it works, why is it effective because of the test and train, and which cases, when all it will be effective. So far, so good. One now question. let's sorry, sorry. Come one again. Uh, okay, one question. So we sure. spoke about the accuracy. Yes. Uh, but uh, the output, for example, if the model is built, trained and, uh, you know, tuned, let's say. Mm -hmm. So after that, uh, will it give a deterministic output or there also there could be, a, you know, uh, changes. For example, after, once the model is trained and tested, if mm -hmm. I give one input, it is going to repeatedly give the same output or that also can be different. No, for the same input, the output is going to be uh, different, same. Yes, so though for the, the same input, is... if you are getting different outputs, we are in trouble. Okay, so if I understand it this way, though the accuracy is uh, less, I mean, 
accuracy is less meaning it is not 100% let's say it is 80% mm. but for that defined accuracy the outputs will be deterministic output is always deterministic it was never it is never going to be random you are okay. going to take an input you are going to run the same function again and again and then you are going to get the same output you are not going to get different output at uh, different point in time so long as the model is same same input will get you the same output no doubt about it okay only only uh, concern here is if i give one input and in the training data set there are two possible outputs which one is it going to choose in this case it will choose the maximum one because we said minimize the cost function maximize the accuracy what is the uh, four will be the better zero will be the better choice because there are four uh, instances Instant. out of six has zero as the number so i get the accuracy uh, higher accuracy that's all okay so one to many mapping is the concern which uh, we should address or we should be aware of at least and we will get an idea okay this data set can at the most have 70% accuracy there is no point trying to improve the accuracy beyond 70% or beyond 80% from the data set we should get an idea before even start starting to model them okay okay i just okay. want to make a comment this is arvind here yeah arvind yeah so this is a very useful example uh, it explains simply the one to many case Mm -hmm. But people should not get the wrong idea that machine learning is limited, uh, you know, because of this reason. So mm -hmm. here, what I would say is uh, the example is underspecified or the problem is underspecified. What I mean okay. by that is that you have only one variable, which is your X. Let's say yeah, credit, start score, credit score is available. Mm -hmm. And based on that, you decide whether the loan is sanctioned or not. So four times it is not sanctioned, uh, two times it is sanctioned for the case of X is equal to 28. Yes. But if you think about it, uh, actually what happens in a bank, they don't look only at credit uh, the credit score. There is a reason why four did not succeed, why two succeeded. That means they must be having in, in their uh, data set other parameters which they are looking at, whether the person has a job, mm. you know, how much salary the person is earning, how many yeah. people are there in the household. So they will have other parameters on which this decision is taken. It is not purely based on X. Yes. So now if this extra data is available to the machine learning algorithm model, then it will do a better job. It is not limited by... Uh, so the accuracy is not limited. It's just that this data set is limited. Yes, that that's right. The data set uh, is uh, specially designed. Even otherwise, Let's say you have 10 variables. Assuming all 10 variables are categorical variables, then uh, we have noticed for the same combination of categorical variables, we got two outputs. So, uh, the yeah, instead of x, we have x1 to x10. Uh, uh, the combination of uh, values in these variables uh, had two outputs. So, that uh, yielded us. Uh, some notion about what the accuracy could be. Yeah, if it is categorical variables, if it is continuous variables, then the game is altogether taken to a different level. If that's continuous variable, it's quite possible we if we are able to improve the accuracies. Yeah, thanks, Arvind, for that. So, others have any thoughts, any questions before we move on to the neural networks? That's the last piece. Okay, now that uh, we learned different techniques, right? We know there is for regression itself, there's linear regression, nonlinear regression, and uh, for classification, uh, the math is different. The, the math for uh, regression, math for classification, math for uh, uh, PCA or dimensionality reduction, all are different math, right? Now there is this technique called neural networks and deep learning. These math doesn't matter. Now that machine learning itself is more of trial and error, but uh, the specification uh, we have to be very clear, right? We we need the neural net, we need the linear regression or not, we need uh, uh, classification or not. Those specifications have to be very clear. Whereas deep learning, it has standardized the whole lot of things. 
neural networks and deep learning has standardized the whole lot of things. What does that mean? The math is same. Always the neural networks use the back propagation as the math. And uh, only architecture is what we play with. So whether you are uh, whether you are doing regression, whether you are doing uh, classification or dimensionality reduction, you are going to use the same math. So we will discuss that math briefly and then we will ramp it up. So we have two columns here, X and Y. So the, uh, the output is column Y. And uh, that's something I want to make it very clear here. Let me make it. So you give input as a X and we, we try to identify this weight. Weight is the parameter here which we are looking to estimate. And this is the operation, summation operation. And we get an output. And this, based on this output, we are going to do back and forth. Let's see here. For, so for this case, there are five values. Uh, five inputs, X values and five outputs, Y values. So we want to estimate the parameter. So if I give one to five here, when will I get the output to two, two, five, six, seven, nine. So I'll start with five as the weight. So what will happen if I start with five as the weight? One into five, two into five, three into five, four into five, five into five. So one into five becomes five, two into five is 10. So the mean squared error, 1 into 5 is 5, 5 minus 2 the whole square, 2 into 5, 10, 10 minus 5 the whole square, 3 into 5, 15, 15 minus 6 the whole square, 4 into 5, 20, 20 minus 7 the whole square, 5 into 5, 25, 25 minus 9 the whole square. So I get all the whole squares and I get the error, total error or a mean squared error, that's a cost function. I get the outputs, I get the cost function, I get a bigger number as the error. Now that the bigger number is the error, I go back and change the weight. My initial weight is 5. Now should I increase the weight or decrease the weight? So that is a call. For the first time, I increase the weight. I change it to 7. The error further increases. And henceforth, what is the learning? I should have decreased the weight. From 5, I decrease the weight to 3. From 3, I decrease it to 2. When I decrease it to 2, the error will be minimum. And when I go to one, the error will start shooting up. So uh, ba basically the trial and error will decide what the weight is. That's the message. We already discussed it's all going to be trial and error. Uh, there is only one input and one output and there is some weight and some operation happens. It's summation operation. So this is the very basic uh, perceptron neural network, we can call it. Okay, now let's extend this. I'll go to this. Yeah, that is the sheet. Uh, I should go here. So this is the X and Y we are talking about. We assumed 5 as the weight. Because we assumed 5 as the weight, this into 5 minus the output and then square. So this is the total error. Is this five, nine, two, three, four, five? Okay, one is missing. Okay, that's because I did not copy paste it as values. Let me do that. Now I try seven. Uh, the error has gone up. So this is the mean square error, right? So this sum or average of this is the mean square error. 108, the average uh, error has gone up. So we change it to three. By doing three, the error would have gone. Okay. So I should do further. So this is B, this is C. And this is 52. So the error has gone up and now the error has gone down. Let me do the same thing for two. Error has gone down further. Let me do the same thing for one. Now the error has started going up. So if this is something I plot in the 
line plot or uh, so the error is going down error went up and at uh, this point is where minimum fourth point so point 0.6 is this so the best parameter is 2 this is something we found out using trial and error method let's do one more math we understood if i take 2 and uh, if we know the uh, slope is 2. What if the slope is 2? This into 2. So these are the predicted values. These are the actual values. These are observed as they call it. These are estimated values as they call it. Correct. Uh, now what happens? There is a different architecture altogether. We try two different models basically uh, we increase the number of nodes we increase the number of nodes in the hidden layer this is the input layer this is the output layer this is the uh, processing layer or hidden layer you may want to call it we when we have two nodes in the in, uh, hidden layer what ineffectively we are doing is we are building two models see here there is one weight and we got an output there is another weight we got an output so what happens is, so this is the estimated one and let's say estimated two. I go and set 1.5 as the weight. So this into 1.5 will be the outcome. This into 1.5 will be the outcome or 2.2, let's say 2.2 would be better for this example, I think. Now that we have two models, one with slope 2, another is with slope 2.2. When we combine these two models, combine I mean another arithmetic combination of these two models, what will happen? You have two lines and uh, your arithmetic combination of two models will still result in another straight line. All of you with me? Any arithmetic combination. So let's say uh, this is the equation, right? Uh, how will I draw the equation? I can take this and put it here. Insert cut cells. Or, uh, or either this. This will be better. Okay. Mm. How will I reduce this? OK. So these are the two lines we have fitted for the same data. One has slightly higher slope, one has slightly smaller slope. Any arithmetic combination of these two lines will result in another line, straight line. For example, let's say we give uh, twice the weightage uh, to the first column and then uh, half the weightage to the second column. And if I do this, and if I take this and plot it, I again get another straight line. Whatever be the weight, I give the give it for the first straight line and the second straight line. What I end up is another straight line. So effectively, what is happening is we can build more than one model for a given data set by increasing the number of nodes in a hidden layer. Basically, we get how let's say if there are five nodes, we get five different slopes, five different weights, and we try to use all the five different models and make it into one single model. If in this particular case, if it is all straight lines, we end up with another straight line, nothing new. So uh, this is in not effective, actually speaking, whereas if it is not, uh, there is something called non-linearity. Uh, if the data is non-linear, we can predict with uh, more than one weight and there is this non-linear transformation in addition to in addition to uh, uh, operation we do a non-linear transformation here it's called sigma transformation or sigmoid basically the transformation is nothing but uh, we are already familiar with right uh, the logistic regression chart we are familiar with not in this 
yeah this this linearity will get uh, transformed into non linearity basically it will get constrained between 0 and 1 so uh, so every time we apply a weight to the input maybe one input or more than one input every time we apply the weight to the input and multiply the input with the weight and then we apply the non linear transformation what in effect happens is we have multiple models basically multiple non linear models and then when we bring when we aggregate all the models we get a, a more complex non linearity for example uh, that's where i thought i'll give you this this yeah here it is this is the chapter Look at this, this is a non-linear curve. So if you have a straight line, if the, if the data is linear, you don't even need a non-linear transformation. That's what it is. You don't need the non-linear transformation. You don't even need multiple uh, nodes within the hidden layer. This itself will do sufficient. Uh, one, one, one node in the hidden layer is sufficient for to fit a no linear model and we don't need any non linearity whereas for non linearity we have to uh, do this non linear transformation let's say there is only once the non linearity there is only one peak and everything is simple then one node is sufficient if there are more non linearities there are peaks and the bottoms if you see here uh, there are more more than one peak one two three four five so the more the peaks the more the number of nodes you will need in the hidden layer and uh, first uh, no first model will model the first peak second model will model the second peak third model will model the third peak like that we can have n number of models uh, so what does that basically means the more the complex the data is you will need more number of nodes in the hidden layer and when you every node is going to model one non linearity and you when you aggregate it the all the non linearity gets uh, reflected none of them gets lost like in the linear regression so this is the page which gives you animation and the real experience let's see i go here Uh, nicely explained. OK, so what happens? If you increase the weight, what happens? If you decrease the weight, what happens? So this is uh, nicely done. Uh, I would say take a look at it. Uh, I'll tell you the exact place. Ah, here it is. <laughs> so because you have uh, two uh, nodes, you can model uh, complications to this extent. Yes, see the number of nodes and you can model complications to what extent. You increase the number of nodes, uh, you solve the problem. Ah. So any problem can be solved. That's what uh, uh, the essence here is. So I would say take a look at this uh, at leisure. And this will give a lot of uh, insights into uh, what we discussed just now. So this is very well animated extension beyond sigma neurons, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I would suggest this chapter four is very important. Uh, read it so we'll know this. So uh, the the basic thing which we have to remember is if the model is simple linear, we don't even need nonlinear transformation. Uh, we only need a weight and operation. We don't even need more than one nodes in the hidden node. If the model is complex, let's say if there is one nonlinearity, we apply one node with the nonlinear transformation. If the as the problem becomes more and more complex, that can be solved with the help of adding more and more nodes in the hidden layer. And further complex problems can be addressed by adding more and more layers. In this case, this hidden layer is only one. We can have more than one hidden layer. Each layer can have more than one hidden node. Uh, so the more and more complex the problem gets, the more and more nodes, more and more hidden layers, 
uh, and the uh, non-linear transformation will solve the problem for us. And this particular sheet, chapter four, will help you, uh, uh, you know, identify that to learn this. Okay, and uh, this takes us to the last thing which we wanted to discuss: the universal approximation function or universal approximation theorem, as they call it. Okay. So universal approximation theorem tells any problem can be solved. That's what it tells. It is universal. If there is a function in a neural network can approximately approach the result to do the job. This results holds for any number of inputs or outputs. So uh, barring this one constraint which we spoke about, uh, this is also not relevant anymore, but uh, we did speak about, right? Where is that one? Okay, this one to many mapping. Since problems become complex, we cannot really say it's one to many mapping. You can assume everything is one to one mapping, and any problem can be solved, be it image, be it text, be it uh, uh, voice, or the structured data. Uh, this is why deep learning is so effective. You have a problem, you have a input and you need output. There is a function in between that can be modeled uh, if you are using the neural networks. So no other technique has, let's say linear regression as a technique or a tree algorithm as a technique for classification cannot solve all the problems. It has its own limitations. It will solve the problems of particular kind within the boundaries, whereas neural networks and deep learning, there is no boundary at all. You have an input and you want an output. This can be modeled. That is why a deep learning is so effective and so prevalent. Today, all the problems to, till the latest, that is GPT, they call it right, chat GPT, is all solved using deep learning. It's all about estimating these weights, giving right inputs, uh, deciding on the right number of hidden layers and uh, number of nodes in each layer and giving the right nonlinear transformation and designing the output. So this deciding all this is called an architecture. So you may have one dimensional input, two dimensional input, three dimensional input. How do you process the input with the architecture in the deep learning and uh, arrive at an output? That's why any problem and every problem is solved and can be solved with the help of neural networks and deep learning. So, uh, and then this is the uh, for reading material. You can read it. Actually speaking, I've taken the definition itself from that website. And uh, okay, here uh, it's not showing it to me. So here, uh, this is the definition I've taken and uh, shown it to you. So basically what they say is a uh, neural networks can model any input to give an output. So this is a very important theorem going not only theorem, it is in practice also uh, we, we people are solving all the problems which cannot be thought of solving before using deep learning, neural networks and deep learning. <laughs> So um, that's all I had. Uh, now we'll open the floor for questions or any general discussions also with, with the topic, and then we can close it. Any thoughts, any feedback? We are open to hear. Uh, 